This task was appointed to you if you do not find a way. No one will. This scene from The Return of the King is similar to the scenario which plays out in the book. Frodo and Sam are being pursued by Shelob, the great primordial spider, within her dark cavernous lair. Female spiders often appear as symbols for the chaotic feminine, whose desire to devour the hero consumes all attempts at self-determination. However, the chaotic feminine possesses a secret, as Jung writes, it is just the most unexpected, the most terrifyingly chaotic things, which reveal a deeper meaning. Although femininity is often equated with chaos, it possesses a hidden, life-enriching secret, and the potential to give birth to a higher order. As Frodo and Sam are on the verge of being eaten, Frodo remembers the light of Galadriel, and uses it to find his way in the darkness. Myths have subtly hinted at the rejuvenating quality of the feminine, and an experience of our feminine sides often catalyzes our moments of psychological transformation. Everything in life has a positive and negative pole, and in this video, I want to discuss the positive pole of the feminine, and how the feminine side of the psyche can act as a healing agent whenever we face suffering and adversity. It is inevitable that each person will face darkness in their lives. The world can be a cruel place, and nobody is spared from the apparent maliciousness of the world around us. We may face physical pain, which causes us to feel isolated and fated to suffer alone. We may be betrayed by those who we trusted, and find it hard to trust anybody again. We may be genuinely wronged by another person, treated unjustly or unfairly by the system, and be forced to confront a world plagued by corruption. We may find ourselves regretting what we did in the past, forever wondering what could have been. The adversity which this world forces upon us can fill us with feelings of anxiety, depression, despair, and hopelessness. These feelings are propounded by the fact that our egos develop with certain presuppositions and expectations about the world and about ourselves, which sometimes turn out to be false. We go into the world expecting that our friends will always be there, only to later find that everybody changes and may drift away. We expect to work in a job we love, only to find ourselves in work that we find soul-crushing, or to be fired for unfair reasons. We expect to fall in love eternally, only for the feeling to inevitably fade. Since what the ego anticipates in the world is so strongly connected with one's personal orientation, it can be crushing when we face adversity which our upbringing did not prepare us for. Oftentimes the ego, which is strongly connected with the masculine side of the psyche, will have difficulties facing a world which differs from its prior assumptions. This is especially true regarding the ego's experience and understanding of itself. We all think of ourselves in a way which is probably different from reality, and it can be a painful experience to discover this shadow side. We discover the shadow when we come into facts which cause us to question our self-image. Failing to meet the expectations of those around us may make us and them aware of the fact that we are not the person they imagined us to be. Being embarrassed and feeling shame is often a consequence of overinflated self-expectations, when we push ourselves beyond our actual limits, only to find that we are not as strong, smart, or as capable as our egos led us to believe. And being aware of our weaknesses often causes us to lash out. Among the inferiorities which exist in the shadow, the most dangerous are moral inferiorities. We may have a conception of what it means to be a moral human being, and attempt to hold ourselves to such moral standards. But the shadow we repress by doing so may get out, so to speak, when we have a lapse of consciousness. Such an experience can often make us aware of the fact that we are not the morally superior being which the ego likely imagined, but indeed possess a dark side and that we often fail to meet the moral standards which society holds us to. A confrontation with this dark side is normally one which the ego may stubbornly resist. Instead of honestly reflecting on our inferior qualities, we often project these outwards and blame others for all of our problems. This attitude is very common, but it doesn't actually allow us to grow as human beings and adapt to the world. The masculine attitude naturally resists the confrontation with ego-shattering experiences, and attempts to fight against them. This attitude can bear fruitful consequences when overcoming great difficulties, but it can also cause us to fall further into psychological turmoil if reality continues to be incompatible with our egos. It is characteristic of the masculine logos to reject all interpretations which don't accord with its previous assumptions 
in an attempt, often a futile one, to preserve the dying ego. The masculine side of our psyche will naturally feel frustrated and will often attempt to repress the negative emotions. But the fact is, we simply can't man up and face every situation as the hero. Feelings of frustration and resentment can only take us so far, and sooner or later, the inflated ego will burst, and we are forced to question everything we formerly believed. This experience of losing one's sense of identity, when our previous conceptions of ourselves and of the world are no longer adequate, may feel like we are cast adrift with no guiding light to orient us in the storm of life. The death of the ego leads to the rushing up of psychic contents which were previously repressed. One is made aware of their shadow and the ugly side of the world. Painful emotions such as sadness, guilt, despair, and melancholy flood the psyche as the ego can no longer act as a barrier to resist these unwanted feelings. These unconscious contents can feel like a chaotic storm which threatens to overtake the psyche, and many times they do. The ego functions as the bastion of order in the psyche, but when the ego dies, a kind of unruly chaos originating from the unconscious can overcome a person. This can naturally have negative consequences, but it is this chaotic state which often gives birth to a new order, in which true psychological transformation can occur, and it is all thanks to the anima. The feminine side of the psyche was called the anima by Jung, and by this term he wished to designate something which felt alive and soulful within the psyche. The anima is often projected upon women, who seem to embody a man's feminine side, leading to the mystical feeling of falling in love. However, the anima is not inherently feminine. It is only so since the traits which characterize the anima are predominant in women, and hence the anima is regarded as female. These traits are chiefly eros and emotionality, which are often regarded as irrational, since it contrasts with the masculine logos principle, which we regard as rational. However, these feminine emotions, which the ego normally suppresses, allows us to heal from the adversity we face. As Jung writes, although she may be a chaotic urge to life, something strangely meaningful clings to her, a secret knowledge or hidden wisdom, which contrasts most curiously with her irrational elfin nature. Masculinity often compels us into holding back our emotions, but in order to recover from psychic distress, we need to be allowed to feel our emotions. Emotions, in contrast to thoughts, allow us to feel engaged in the world around us, rather than feeling like spectators watching from above. Often, our words are used to conceal how we feel, but our feelings are spontaneous, objective occurrences, and point us towards activity in the psyche, and towards how we really think. Emotions also give us a sense for the richness of life, which is otherwise dulled by the conscious orientation. When a person experiences their feminine side, they become softer, more willing to express their feelings, and less egoistic. They, in other words, become humble, and therefore are able to move on from the feeling of ego death. It is often difficult for men to open up about their feelings, and instead wear a concealing mask. But the anima often acts to make a person more open and expressive. This can feel like the death of masculinity, but it really is what allows a stronger masculine side to form later on in the individuation process. It is a common occurrence that a woman helps a man to experience his feminine side, allowing him to be more open with his emotions and willing to talk about things which his ego actively rejects. By working through these feelings, we can become more aware of ourselves and better understand how we can approach life in a more positive way. Without ever opening up and expressing how we feel, we can never confront the things which are bothering us and causing us to have such feelings in the first place. The ego thinks it can go it alone, but humans are a social species, and we need to be open to the possibility that we need help from others. These emotions, which arise from the unconscious, allow the anima to shift the conscious attitude and adopt a more productive worldview. Since according to Jung, the conscious mind is always in danger of becoming one-sided, of keeping to well-worn paths and getting stuck in blind alleys. The anima also has a role in forming social bonds between people, owing to the fact that it seeks connection rather than division. Emotionality allows us to be more empathetic and compels us to form close relationships with others, rather than pursuing selfish goals. In other words, it enables us to be altruistic and seek advice from others, as well as allowing us to understand that our problems are rarely confined to just ourselves. 
The masculine side of the psyche wants to insist that its opinions and ideas are right, but the feminine side is more willing to listen to the perspectives of others, which enables an enriching of knowledge, since in order to learn anything new, we need to give up something which we previously knew. In order to connect with others, the animus supplies us with a feeling of empathy, which makes it possible to understand another person's perspective. The ego, on the other hand, seems only to regard its own perspective as important. But being empathetic allows humans to understand one another, and feel a deep sense of connection, and a sense that we are all navigating the storm of life together. It becomes therefore possible to accept shadow traits, not just in ourselves, but in those around us, and therefore to forgive other people for their flaws as well. We begin to have love for all people, realizing that human flaws are a consequence of human nature, and in order for us to go beyond our nature, we need to accept it. We don't become attached to our idealizations, but instead come to accept reality, including its ugly side. The anima, being closely connected with love, gives us the capacity to love more and hate less, which, if for nothing else, is a healthier mental attitude. This is especially healing when overcoming the shadow, since we often have feelings of self-hatred when we encounter our inferiorities. The feeling of moral inferiority, for which many people seek moral redemption, is granted by the anima, who reveals that our shadows are also a part of us. Through the connective eros, the shadow becomes seen as something which belongs to us, and we are more willing to accept it, and thereby gain a sense of moral redemption, when we sometimes feel ourselves to be morally depraved. The anima gives us a new perspective, through which we can learn to love ourselves, including our shadows. This is why femininity is closely associated with Mother Nature, who entreats us to go gracefully through life, rather than always trying to swim against the currents. The unconscious contents which rise up from the activity of the anima, whenever the ego's stability is shaken, can seem chaotic, random, and too fantastical to be of any value. But the strangeness of these contents is what allows the ego to change its attitude and experience genuine transformation. The unconscious reveals itself to us in strange forms, but by doing so, casts light upon thoughts and ideas which the ego may have previously rejected. As Jung writes, In this way, we find that thoughts, feelings, and affects are alive in us, which we would never have believed possible. This allows us to widen our perspective, and the anima's openness makes it possible to integrate this new information, rather than rejecting it, as is the normal function of the ego. Our thought patterns become modified, and we can think about the world from a different perspective. We can understand the suffering of others, and be more empathetic towards those who have suffered similarly to us. We begin to see that although there is a dark side to life, there is also a beautiful side, which makes life worth living. And we realize that we are not the entire universe, but a small aspect of it, and are thus humble to the forces of the world which we can't control. In other words, we accept the world as it is, and we are able to accept who we are. Any time a new perspective is needed, the anima and the connective capacity of Eros will allow us to do this, and it is only through this process that a person can change for the better. Once he comes to grips with the anima, her chaotic capriciousness will give him cause to suspect a secret order, to sense a plan, a meaning, a purpose over and above her nature. The feminine side grants us the ability to love the world and to be at peace with it, and to overcome the psychological pain which often accompanies life. Any time a change in mental attitude is warranted, the open-minded connective eros allows us to gain a wider perspective and to understand ourselves and the world more clearly, or at least in a more productive manner. Every person reaches a stage when their old ego must be discarded and a new one created. It is also the anima which enables flexibility of thought, rather than simply referring to our past understanding, and so it gives us the means to think more creatively. It is through the anima that we feel connected to the world and to those around us, and this feeling of connection helps to limit the destructiveness which often follows selfishness. The connective eros enables the birth of a new ego, which is more reflective of the true personality, and more accepting of the world and all of its ambiguity. This new ego is often imbued with a renewed sense of purpose, with deeper understanding of the trials and tribulations faced on the journey, and the cycles of darkness which birth a new light. The world becomes seen as richer and more interconnected than previously presumed. Naturally, this process repeats itself multiple times throughout the course of one's life, 
and it doesn't always lead to a positive result. Furthermore, there can be consequences when a person too closely identifies with the feminine principle and prevents the masculine side from reasserting itself. But the resurrection of the ego is a psychological transformation which is made entirely possible by the anima, whose secret healing power helps to rejuvenate the wounded psyche. Only when all props and crutches are broken, and no cover from the rear offers even the slightest hope of security, does it become possible for us to experience an archetype that up till then had laid hidden behind the meaningful nonsense played out by the anima. This is the archetype of meaning, just as the anima is the archetype of life itself.